I didn't fit in America. With cocaine, there's just always too many guns and too many bad attitudes. I quit the limiting stories. Really try to overcome that fear. And right there, for any of your listeners, a lot of what I was to do in the rest of my life was formulated by the fact I just went and did it. Welcome to episode three of Misfits and Rejects, where I sat down with India Reinhardt, the owner and operator of Papaya Wellness, and she discusses why she left home at 18 and how she found her true passion when she was on the road adventuring and traveling. You can listen to the entire episode by clicking in the bio. You can subscribe on iTunes or any podcast player on Android. The show notes are broken into five minute chunks. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to Misfits and Rejects, a podcast about expatriates and the artistic way they've styled their lives around the world. I'm your host, Chapin Cruder. Enjoy. I didn't fit in America. Find yourself shipwrecked in a far off place and Dale, welcome to the show. (laughs) Try not to plan too much at all. You know, it'd just be spontaneous. I quit eliminating stories. Really try to overcome that fear. I'm gonna sail again. Yeah. One more. I got one more sailing. Love her, but leave her wild. But it didn't work for me. The American dream wasn't gonna work for me because I didn't fit the American dream. I, I had respect that I was a rubbish farm. Now I'm an old guy, and I respect myself. You know what, Jacob? I'm a secret. And I prefer to just be secret. And if you can figure out who Dale Dagger is, then figure it out. And if you can't, then don't. Welcome to episode four of the Misfits and Rejects podcast. I'm sitting here with the founder of Pi Wellness in the Reinhardts in Nicaragua, a lovely young lady who has taken adventure and expatriatism to a whole new level. And we're going to get to dive deep into her psyche and find out what makes and motivates her to live in these types of places and have the kind of adventures that she has had and continues to have in this life she's chosen for herself. Misfits and Rejects is about expats trying to live abroad and make a life for themselves along with their family sometimes. And as you travel, you get to meet these people and you find out they are extreme, extremely fascinating. So... Welcome into the show. How are you? Great. Thank you. It's nice to have you. It's been a while. Yes, it has. Uh, for our audience out there, Indy and I uh, have a long history together. Uh, this, she is uh, my ex-girlfriend. I guess I'm her ex-boyfriend. We shed a lot of time on the road together, a lot of adventures, a lot of fun times, and a lot of loving moments, and had a great time. Got mad respect for her and what she's accomplished in her life, and I wanted to share with you all. So yeah, welcome, and uh, let's get down to it. So you uh, live in Nicaragua. You yes. run Papaya Wellness, yep. which is a surf yoga retreat for primarily women. Yes, primarily women. Okay, but men are welcome to come too. Absolutely. It's awesome. Definitely co-ed. Awesome. And before we get into that, we'll get into that later in the show. I'd like to talk more about India's background, her upbringing. Um, she's Canadian. She's 33 years old, 31, sorry, and uh, has a really interesting story. So I'm going to let her take over and uh, talk about where she's from and and how she kind of got interested in travel. So if you can just give us an idea, India, about your life in Canada growing up. Actually, why don't you start at the very beginning and where you were born? Um, yeah, okay. So I was born in Jamaica. My mother is Jamaican and my father's German. And um, we lived in Jamaica for about three to four years while I was growing up, and then we all moved to Canada, where there I've been kind of ever since before I moved here. Now, why'd you move to Canada from Jamaica? I mean, it sounds like a really cool place. I mean, your your parents loved it. Your mom's from there. Why did you guys move? Um, I think uh, a big part of it was just for to give my brother and I more opportunities um, and not necessarily have to worry about the violence so much. So that was like a big push for them. And also a lot of her family were living up in Canada. So I think being near more family members also as we were growing up was important for her and for him. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. 
Um, so what kind of life did you find yourself in and where did you find yourself in Canada when you made that move? Um, we moved to Vancouver Island, Victoria. It's a fairly small city. Um, just doing basic kind of family thing. My dad's a family youth counselor. My mom did a lot of graphic work working for immigrant refugee centers and just growing up there with my brother, living a really fun, safe life. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So talk a little bit about that. I mean, the kind of, um, environment you were in pretty adventurous, like what kind of stuff did you do as a kid growing up or even maybe as a teenager? What, what was your, yeah, well, my dad is a super athlete. So probably as really young kids, we, he pushed us into like a lot of sports, giving us opportunity to try different things. I think I've probably tried everything. <laughs> um, and so we, we already had that kind of like athleticism in our family. So like picking up surfing or any other kind of board sports, a lot of snowboarding and stuff came kind of second nature to me and my brother. Yeah. And you, you're a surfer. You love it. Yeah. Love it. Nice. Definitely my passion. Nice. And did your parents take you on many family vacations growing up? Like, how did you get the bug to travel? Yeah, so my parents' mentality, seeing how my mom grew up in a more third-world environment, and it wasn't so much about that first-world kind of consumerism and staying home and Christmases and things like that. It was more trying to get us out and exploring different countries and different cultures and showing us a different way of living. So that's probably what spiked a lot of my travel interest. Nice. Just them taking us to places, and places that were obviously had a lot of beach breaks and beaches so surfing was at a young age something that we got into okay yeah so can you recollect an adventure that you had with them that really just kind of like stands out as being a motivator for you to continue on on your travels yeah well we had so many okay. we probably did one or two every year and so they're all amazing and all different and where were you going like the types of places was it like Mexico or... Yeah, we did a lot of um, road trips. So we drove from Canada, we've done it three times, where we drove through the States down to Mexico. Okay. And we went all the way over to Florida. Wow. Um, so we did a lot of family road trips. were really fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a lot of camping. We did our first trip where we camped in the Baja, right at the end of the Baja, and camped under a Palapa for four weeks in our Dodge van. No so, way. Well, that was pretty fun and exciting. So just you, your mom, your dad, and your brother, four weeks in a van at the tip of all. Yeah. Wow. Did you surf? Um, we surfed a little bit on the way down, but I was more, I was younger then, so I was boogie boarding. Okay. Uh, so my surfing kind of interest started a few years later. Okay. But we were definitely always playing in the ocean, body surfing, boogie boarding, whatever. We okay. did a lot of like free diving just for fun. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So... As you grew up, you finished school. Did you go to college? No. Did you do any kind of like trade work or any anything like that? Yeah. Like what um, was your What's your background? What was your interest go growing up? What do you think you wanted to be? Well, I actually it? wanted to be a lifeguard. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I watched a lot of Baywatch. I know it sounds cheesy, but I uh, I always wanted to be kind of a beach lifeguard because I like the ocean and I got into first aid. Mm -hmm. So I became a lifeguard, but in Canada we don't really have those. Nice punk sandy beaches, so I ended up being a pool lifeguard for probably the my first profession in my life, mm -hmm. the first few years, and then continued to take on the health and wellness practice into other fitness routines, such okay. as teaching fitness and okay. stuff. That's great. So you kind of knew from the beginning you'd be doing something in the fitness, health and wellness environment, like lifeguarding or yoga or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And then when was your first big step outside of your comfort zone by yourself? Like when was your first big trip and, and how'd that play out? Um, my first trip was when I was 18 mm -hmm. and I actually came to Nicaragua. It was my first time here. I was 18. It was about 2002 and I just grabbed my surfboard and decided to come down on my own I don't think my dad was that happy about it, but we compromised and I stayed with a family for three months and did a homestay situation in San Juan del Sur, mm -hmm. which gave me a little bit of confidence with the language, with Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then I traveled around Central America on my own, just surfing. So that was kind of my first adventure by myself. That's incredible. Now, why Nicaragua? How did you choose that? Did you just pull it out of a hat? Like, how did you, at a, as an 18-year-old living in Canada, like, in 2002, nobody was coming to Nicaragua, so... Why'd you choose Nicaragua? 
Um, well, I chose Nicaragua because, to be honest, it was the cheapest language school. Ah, okay. So we did a lot of research before the different language schools and what they offered for homestay situations. And it just seemed to be the the least expensive, but also like offering you the most. And it kind of had their stuff together and same with the family. So it just sounded the most appealing out of all the places. And that's kind of why I chose it, which is crazy because I could have landed somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I think that's how a lot of people start off. You know, they have this itch to travel the world and they don't have a big budget. So they just kind of choose the cheapest place to go for mm-hmm. the longest amount of time. And how did you, uh, how were you able to afford all that with your uh, lifeguard money? Yeah, I like, I definitely worked and saved up a lot before doing the trip. I moved to a surf town before I came here to Fino. It's on the West coast of Canada and worked there as chambermaid and, did some surf lessons and whatever kind of jobs I could get on the side, saving as much money, some waitressing and stuff. And then, yeah, saved it up and away I went. And how long was that trip for? That was about seven months. Wow. Travel. So you did three months in Nicaragua and then you traveled all around Central America on your own by yourself. Yeah. So I just took um, chicken buses, the local buses, and I went all up through El Salvador and over to Honduras, and then went to Utila and got my open water dive certification. And then I went back down to Costa Rica and then looped back and stayed in Nicaragua again for another month or so before going back. Wow. So let's talk a little bit more about like how that felt as a single female at the age of 18, traveling around Central America by yourself. I mean, did you have any apprehensions or fears or? Definitely. I think that because I travel a lot as a, a kid with my parents, that kind of gave me a pretty good like backbone to what I was going to get into. But um, you're just, you just listen to the locals and just get a good knowledge of like places to be and when to be. So I had, I went to school for three months, so I felt really good having the language as my, um, having a bit of security and then just, you know, not going out at night necessarily by yourself in a place you don't know and meeting people along the way. And I had a really great experience. Um, you know, knock on one, but nothing's ever happened and pretty respectful to the cultures I'm in. So I've had pretty good luck and yeah. So yeah, you'd say that by respecting the cultures that you're in, either whether it's like dressing appropriately or whatever and using common sense. Exactly. Um, will get you a long ways and a little bit of luck. Exactly. I mean, everyone can get unlucky at some point, but it sounds like you had a good head on your shoulders and just use your brain and you got around long fine. Exactly. So then what happened? So you moved back to Canada. Yeah. And then I went back to Canada and started working again. I moved back to Victoria where I went to school and I think I did some more lifeguarding and other odd and then jobs and just try to save up money again to for get my next road. trip. Okay. Yeah. The itch to travel always came okay. usually within the year okay. <laughs> being somewhere. Let's talk about then your next trip and where is that and how that happened. And how'd you choose the places that you went? Where'd you go? So I went to Europe after that. Okay. Uh, my parents rented a villa in Southern Italy and they told my brother and I, if we paid for our own flights, they would put us up for the month that they were there. And we thought that was a pretty good deal. So we both saved up a bunch of money, flew over to Italy. And then I started this like year long journey in Europe where I just ended up I just kept going and going. Had that been a plan from the start or was that kind of spontaneously just happening as the month ended with your parents? You're like, I'm going to continue on for a year. Yeah, it, it was definitely spontaneous. I ran out of money in the first two months that I was there. So I started working and I worked my way around Europe and just worked places and lived in places. And when I got another job in a new place, I'd move there and kind of just went with the flow for quite a while. That was probably my longest trip. Incredible. Let's talk more about that because I think that is something that not many people do in the way that you did it, running out of money in the first two months and then figuring it out in a foreign country that you probably aren't legally allowed to work. Like, what did you do and how did you find work? Well, nowadays online, you can find a lot of different types of styles of work. So I started looking online at being an au pair and I moved to Madrid where I au paired a family, um, these two kids for the summer in Spain. So that brought me to Spain for three months. And then I did a lot of weekend and week long day trips when I was in Spain. And then I saved up enough money when I was au pairing to move to another small little community on the 
coast of Spain where I could surf and I just did some random like waitressing jobs and worked in a hostel and kind of then met somebody else that told me that they, there was a position for a surf guide in Morocco. Wow. Morocco. Yeah. And that's when like that, my whole surf guiding industry for me really took off when I went there. I didn't even know surf camps existed until somebody told me about this position and I applied and I got it. So and then away I went to Morocco. So you applied online in Spain Yes. and you made your way to Morocco. How'd you get to Morocco? Um, I met somebody and he was driving down also starting a surf camp. So the deal was, is I would help, help him get his things started before mine, my job started and he'd give me a lift down. So we drove from Northern part of Spain all the way down to Tagazu, which is like middle of Morocco. What was that experience like? I mean, you're, did you know him at all? Or you just jumped in a car like, I, going I, for it? I kind of knew him a little bit. I met him over the last month and he seemed okay. nice and there's a little trust. So cool. we went with it. <laughs> nice. And then, so you drove and how was that experience driving through Morocco? Like, I mean, Morocco is pretty foreign, I'd say for any Westerner to go and experience like, yeah. The culture is quite different from ours. How did that feel as a female in Morocco and what was your experience like? Yeah, that would, that experience was definitely, it was a really different experience out of everywhere I've ever traveled. Cause obviously the culturally, um, is, uh, it's quite different there. And I just found that you had, I had to make sure that I was dressed appropriately. Um, because regardless really how I was dressed being blonde and blue eyes, I stood out so we definitely get a lot of looks, but again, it's just being mindful when you travel and, you know, not going to places that people tell you not to go and going out late at night if you shouldn't be, you know, and just being really like careful of the culture there. So I wore like long pants and long arms and actually sometimes wrap my head as well mm-hmm. in really rural parts where like I was probably the first white person I've mm-hmm. ever seen. <laughs> okay. So. That's exciting. So how long did you stay in Morocco? I was there for about four months. Running a surf camp? Yeah, I was one of the surf guides. Okay. Yeah. And your clientele was coming from where? Primarily all over Europe. Okay. I didn't really get too many, like, North Americans. Um, flights are all pretty cheap within America, so a lot of English and French and Spanish and German. So mostly Europeans coming down for a week. Interesting. Just of surfing. So then what happened after that? After that, they asked me if I wanted to manage their other camp in Portugal. So I got in the car when the season was over and we drove back up all the way to Portugal. And it, I was in a town called Ericeira, which is kind of just north, a little bit of Lisbon. And I managed their surf camp there for the season, which was about five months. So how old are you at this point? Probably 22. Okay. Um, I think around that age. And you've been running around Europe, now Africa, and now you're back in Europe as a manager of a surf camp in Portugal. Did you have to speak Portuguese? No. No. Mostly because most of our guests were all, again, like foreigners that spoke English. So English was kind of the primary language. But what about dealing with the help? Like they, I'm assuming, spoke Portuguese and you had to tell them what to do. Yes. Um, a lot of the staff we hired were actually foreigners as well, being on like a volunteer base. And then a few of the other locals, I would have a translator. So I had somebody that would help me translate. When I needed. That's exciting. Incredible yeah. story. So then what? I mean, you were there for five months and now did, did you go to Asia or what happened next? No, I actually flew from, uh, was it Lisbon, I believe? Uh, straight to Managua, Nicaragua from there. So I went straight back to Nicaragua because I missed it. And then I spent three months in Nicaragua just cruising and hanging out. And that's where I I met my mom and dad, I believe. We did Christmas there. (laughs) Years kind of blur a little bit. And then I came back home after. Incredible. That was a long stint. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, it was. Um, So... You've been on the road now for years at this point because mm-hmm. you're around, what, 22, you said? Yes. Um, and is this when you think maybe you started knowing that this is a life you might want to lead for yourself abroad? Like, was it just like, I'm going to now move my life to a third world country? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think 
while I was traveling, just seeing like a lot of young people, especially when I worked in the camps, just being entrepreneurs and developing their own business really like kind of sparked that interest for me. So I always kind of had that on the back burner. That's something I've always wanted to do is create my own business. But before I did that, I just started, I just worked in more surf camps and jobs that were related to what I would be interested in doing. Um, getting my yoga certification and just kind of enhancing my own kind of profession so that when I was ready to open my own business, I had all the qualifications. That's great. I think what you just said, I think a lot of people can get a lot of benefit from because I think a lot of people have these sorts of desires and don't know where to start. So for example, if you want to run a coffee shop, probably best to like go work in a coffee shop for years, getting to know the business in and out. It sounds like that's what you instinctively just knew what to do. It's like, I want to live abroad. I want to definitely do something in health and wellness. I love surfing. So surf camps kind of became that natural job that you saw, sought out, you know, in Morocco and Portugal and then Nicaragua. So you went back to Canada after that three months with your parents in Nicaragua after that year long trip. And you worked some more with the idea to come back to Nicaragua or how, how did that transition happen? How long did it take for you to actually come back to Nicaragua and say, this is it, this is a life I'm going to leave? Well, I went, I came back, I was in Canada and I got a job at actually a heli ski lodge, which is totally opposite. It went from like the super hot, sunny Southern countries straight to snow a week later. And that was a super fun experience for me. But being in the mountains, I realized it's just, it wasn't necessarily for me and just like really wanting to get back to the beach so that was like a pretty good indicator that it was a life that I wanted to have. So I, I met a girl and ended up moving back to Nicaragua and got another job at a surf camp and wanted to, again, like keep kind of growing my experience. And then about three years into that job, I realized that I really wanted to start my own you know, surf company, mm -hmm. some sort of business. Mm -hmm. um, I did go home in between the times that I was here to get other education. I went and did some business workshops and evening courses and to get a better understanding of business so that when I was ready to open a business, I kind of had fundamentals. That's awesome. So yeah, so then it <clears throat> sounds like you have a great background then for running surf camps now. So then what, you start a surf camp or what was, what happened? Well, after working at a surf camp and working at several surf camps, I've kind of realized, you know, what the things that people wanted and what certain camps might have been lacking and the things that I could offer that other people weren't offering. And so it kind of fell into my lap really naturally being in Nicaragua and also being a still developing country. There's lots of opportunities. So I kind of decided with all the experience I had to start my own surf and yoga retreat company where people could come for a week long, kind of like how I did the camps before, but focus not only on surfing, but having the yoga aspect and also integrating a lot of cultural activities into the week package, basically giving people the ultimate week experience. If they only have a week of getting to do a little bit of everything. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. So that's when what papaya wellness was born. Papaya wellness was born. Okay. And what year was that? That was about five. Wow. Yeah. wow. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> I'm you spent, to back at the time. spent a lot of time down here developing your craft. And then when mm -hmm. it came time, you pulled the trigger and started Pi wellness, which is a surf yoga retreat based business that incorporates, um, a lot of cultural activities for your guests. Is that correct? Does that yeah. sound about right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about more Pi wellness then and, and where you're at now. So you've been open four to five years approximately. How was that? to start it, build it in a third world country. I mean, what kind of hardships or was it super easy and like, how'd that all go? And, and where'd you get the money to do it? Was it just through savings or did you have to take out a loan or something like that? And where'd you get the loan? Was it in Nicaragua or Canada? So well, that's a lot of questions. Don't ask, but. <laughs> that's okay. Um, well, actually my parents really helped me out a lot because they they've seen kind of my ambition to want to create a company and my own business. And so they helped me out and gave me a little loan. And actually in return, my mom helps work for us now. So my parents have been able to 
make a bit of income from my business, which is nice. So it's kind of, it feels like a little bit of a family run business. And it definitely had its challenges in the beginning because we were in a third world country and not just the language being always like a barrier of stuff, but just learning the way this country works and what doesn't work and the littlest things is the power going out and the internet going out and just the, the things that make business at home <laughs> a lot easier because you don't have to worry about them. You have to worry about creating business and all the other stuff about living in a third world country. Okay. So it definitely has its challenges. Yeah. And you ran it for the first year or two by yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, I ran it one season by myself the first year before I met Carly. She wasn't around. And then the second year, I was going in to run it again. And uh, I met Carly, and she had actually had been moving to Gigante and, and doing the same kind of style stuff, teaching surfing. She had run a retreat, doing yoga. And uh, we decided that instead of trying to compete with each other and be the same type of business in the small town, we would join up and combine our forces and build it together, which is the best move we've ever done. <laughs> so you, you are happy with that decision to yes. bring on a partner and you feel like that's been a really nice addition to your company. Yes. Amazing. I've, I've heard a lot about business and partnerships, partners with families and friends and it, like just business partners in general is a, a one of the hardest things with running a business. Um, but I feel like just from the very beginning, Carly and I have been, a great match together because mm -hmm. we excel in different areas of our company and we're both really good communicators. And so I couldn't really ask for a better business partner to have. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds like you both have a really nice cohesive relationship and play off each other's mm -hmm. strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. That's great. So now Papaya Wellness today, it's, it's grown to a point that you both can live your lives the way you want. You're not struggling anymore. You're not scraping by or what? Well, it's still growing, so we run it seasonally still. So we do it six months out of the year. Mm -hmm. And then the other six months, I might go back to Canada or we might dive into other things. Um, we could move it to full time, but we also it really enjoy what we do. We don't want to, like, make our work take over our lives and then all of a sudden, you know, become not interested in our work anymore. So we like to keep it still to a point where we can have other forms of work to kind of stagger it but we are still growing and we love our company and it definitely has its ebbs and flows but every year it gets better and we seem to have a lot of returning guests and a lot of positive people on our side so it's definitely looking to be a really good future that's awesome what will you be doing like to grow the business i mean you how do you market it and who do you market it to and are you stationed primarily in nicaragua our business is primarily Nicaragua. We, we try to host one retreat a year abroad to change it up so that our returning guests can join us somewhere else. Uh, we've gone to Bali twice. I think we have a couple of new locations. We, on the horizon, we'd like to check out Morocco or maybe Ecuador. We have a few spots, so we're always trying to find cool new spots to take people. Um, so, yeah, it's primarily here, and most of our marketing is done through social media, probably Instagram, Facebook, small bits of marketing here and there. Carly and I don't have a massive budget, so we do what we can ourselves. And then once in a while, you know, a couple times a year, we'll dive into a bit of a marketing tool, like a magazine or whatever we can. Mm -hmm. But just trying to get exposed, obviously, on the cheaper side of things has mm -hmm. always been our role. <laughs> I'm trying. Nice. So just to switch gears a little bit, let's talk... Um... Sounds like your family is super involved with you. Your mom, you said, works for you a little bit. They have property in Nicaragua. How much time do they spend down here? My parents are here six months out of the year. Okay. Yeah. My dad retired two years ago, so they've spent more time here now. And yeah, I see them all the time, <laughs> probably every week. <laughs> yeah, and it's great. I feel pretty lucky to have them a uh, part of my life. Because a lot of the times, you know, your families, they stay in one spot and you might see them once or twice a year. So I feel really, really fortunate. I have a lot of gratitude that they get to be part of the life I have down here and they're creating their own lives and also that we get to work together. It's pretty special. Sounds like it. So yeah, it doesn't sound like that puts pressure on your family's relationships at all. No, we all get along pretty good. That's great. Super cool. 
I guess time to kind of wrap it up. Would you have any kind of advice for like travelers or people who wish to travel or live the kind of lifestyle that you're living, start a business in a third world country? Like, would you say anything to them to encourage them, discourage them? I mean, it seems like your life here is amazing. You love what you do. I um, wouldn't change it for the world, but I mean, why don't you tell me, you know? Um, I think the biggest thing is just to really try to overcome that fear of obviously the fear of like failure or not knowing if you can do it. Um, and I think you need to kind of muscle up that confidence and just go for it because like all businesses, you know, they don't always succeed and you can start a business in first world country or anywhere. But I think it just takes the confidence to do it and just the trust and just doing what you love to do. And I think if you love what you do, you'll succeed. So I think the biggest thing I could say to people is just to get out there and do it and don't wait around or don't wait for the right time in your life. Just do it now. That's good advice. What, what's next for you, papaya wellness, your life? I mean, any plans or you kind of just wing it, huh? You just get off the plane in some country and just figure it out as you go. Yeah, exactly. I kind of wing it, but um, I, I don't know. I live kind of pretty present and I try to just do my day to day and season to season. So I never really know what the next thing brings. Um, probably investing in some properties so that at least they have some places to stay when I travel around would be a goal, but growing my business nice, and just continuing down that road, ultimately just like being happy, whatever I'm doing. Nice. Mm -hmm. Um, what does your arm say? What does it say under your arm right there? It says, love her, but leave her wild. Love her, but leave her wild. I think that's a appropriate way to describe India. Thank you for joining me, India. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Misfits and Rejects. I hope this inspires you to think about your life situation, where you're at, and possibly make a big decision to choose something different for yourself if you're unhappy with where you're at in life. I hope these people that I interview inspire you to go out, spread your wings, and try something new, to live a different lifestyle that maybe your whole life people were telling you was the wrong one, but when in fact it's the perfect one for you. And I'll see you next time.